Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, webinar, the Sailor webinar on getting America back to work. Um, we are going to talk real briefly, uh, give a brief overview, um, and I'll do some a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jacqueline Arnold. I'm the Director of Strategic Relationships at Sailor Academy, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, wanted to give just a brief overview of the landscape and talk about uh, why we are hosting this webinar. So as many of you know, um, the COVID epidemic has left, uh, particularly in the US, more than 30 million people out of work. Um, in order to help um, both businesses and employer employees return to work safely, um, several changes are going to be needed are going to need to be made in terms of hiring, training, and how we look at keeping um, employees. Um, some of you may be interested in why Sailor Academy is hosting a webinar on this topic. Um, for those of you who do not know us, uh, we are a uh, nonprofit initiative and we are focused on uh, providing free courses that both uh, develop skills as well as higher education opportunities for learners around the world. Um, and I'll show you very quickly some of the topics that we develop these skills on. So our uh, skill development includes um, communication, leadership and teams, so career ready skills, as well as the college credit courses that I mentioned before, um, and some other gateway topics such as English as a second language. Um, so we are very interested in this um, conversation where we're talking about um, accessible training as well as skills-based hiring. Um, and we also, the panel and I thought it was very important to talk about um, how the, how offering access to training and hiring can be an opportunity to um, address issues in equality, particularly um, as we're seeing these issues become more exacerbated with the um, pandemic. Um, it's very easy to see that in uh, pretty much any outcome area, um, the pandemic has exacerbated issues of, uh, um, of economic inequality. Um, people of color, particularly um, Black people and Latinx people, um, have been affected by layoffs um, at almost double the rate um, as that of um, white Americans or Asian Americans. Um, and then there are implications for that, of course, um, in terms of the opportunities that are available to them um, and um, opportunities for higher education. So this is a good conversation and we do hope that this discussion um, and the Q&A discussion after will um, shed some light um, and um, give us an opportunity to dive into these topics a little more deeply. Um, before we go on with the screen share, or before we go on with the presentation, I'd love to have the panel introduce themselves real quickly. Um, Jeff Davidson, would you like to start? Yeah, just really quickly, I'm Jeff Davidson, Executive Director of Sailor Academy. I uh, work with Jackie very closely and been lucky enough to interact with Gene and, and Steve a couple of times over the course of my nine years with Sailor. So very excited to have them both here and learn and listen and very excited to uh, get some Q&A later with the attendees. Excellent. Jean, would you like to go next? Absolutely. I'm Jeannie Contardo. I'm the Managing Director of the Capital CoLab at the Greater Washington Partnership. The CoLab is a partnership between education leaders and business leaders in the Greater Washington region focused on building a diverse digital tech ecosystem. Excellent. And uh, Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Steve Taylor, and I'm the founder and CEO of ed to work and we're a strategy research consulting firm, and we help to mobilize educators, talent leaders, and learner advocates, all to equip working learners with the skills they need to succeed, especially in this post-COVID environment. I also have the privilege of serving as a senior advisor to Capital CoLab at Greater Washington Partnership. Excellent. Um, and so I will pull our slides back up and Steve, I believe you are going to present some data and give a brief overview of what's going on. Yeah, and so I think it's really important and we would be remiss not to address and talk about the impacts of COVID-19 on the labor market. Um, what I would say is before COVID-19 hit, 
there was a trend or a move towards skills-based hiring. Historically, hiring managers were looking at a particular credential, such as a degree, really to serve as that quality indicator or a, a veil of quality uh, for incoming applicants. And what we saw pre-COVID was this shift by talent leaders, by HR leaders, to begin to look and privilege, look at and privilege skills over credentials. So skills-based training, skills-based coursework, or degrees and credentials that could very, very transparently highlight skills or what somebody knows and can do. Um, and that's only exacerbated as a result of COVID. And why that's important is we've now got more than 33 million, um, where it's actually closer to 40 million now, uh, Americans who have filed for unemployment as a result of COVID. Of those Americans who have lost their job resulting from COVID, uh, Gallup and Strata Education Network have done extensive surveys and consumer research uh, on Americans and their intentions as a result of COVID uh, to figure out what their plan is, what they're going to do. And about one third of American adults are now going to seek further education in 2020 to keep their skills current. Again, it's focused on skills, not just go back to get a degree, but get training that can help them uh, attain certain skills that are, are needed in the marketplace and can make them more marketable and competitive in the marketplace. Um, of those one third of Americans, another 34% are specifically looking at new skills for a career change. And this is again in response to COVID-19. Uh, if we think about some of the skills that people will need to acquire, uh, we're now operating in a more distributed workforce or, or workplace. Um, we've gone remote, both in our learning and working environments. And that means uh, employees and potential employees will need to establish um, new skill sets and they will need to acquire new skills like digital literacy, in addition to a plethora of other employability skills, which we'll talk about later on in the presentation. Um, but on that note about digital literacy, I want to kick it over to Jeannie to talk about some of the great work that uh, Capital Co. Lab is doing. Great. Thanks, Steve. And I want to highlight for you a little bit about what's happening across the nation. So we already knew that our workforce was going to be challenged in the coming decade because of just the natural change that's happening to our labor markets. So automation in particular, we were just very aware that this was going to be an issue um, as, as we increase have an increasing amount of automation. We know certain workers in particular are going to be influenced in certain occupations. This has been made worse by COVID-19. So many of those same people who are going to be at risk as a result of automation in their jobs are now at risk first and foremost because of COVID-19. So what maybe they thought was a runway that was several years long in terms of allowing them to think about earning new jobs or finding those skills that they need to move into new directions. Um, that's no longer an option because they're out of work right this second. This is particularly true, unfortunately, for underrepresented groups and women. And so when we look at what's happening to people of color in the workforce, when we look at what's happening to first generation um, students who maybe were in college and who feel like they can't afford it anymore, when we look, um, especially in digital tech, at some of this variation, um, it's really deeply concerning. And so I will say at the, at the Capital Collab, we really put an equity lens at, at the center of what we do. And so when we think about skills-based hiring, this is a really important shift. When you imagine what it can mean for a workforce where you don't necessarily have to have a four-year degree or a graduate degree or a PhD in order to be considered eligible for certain positions, this movement towards skills-based hiring allows us to really have a much better sense of what your abilities are and can allow employers to get very, very granular in terms of what they're looking for. This is particularly important, I will say, for the upskilling and reskilling workforce. It's probably less important for the incumbent workforce that hasn't had a job before um, because there is a general expectation in terms of baseline skills on what early career folks will have. But especially as we look at the, this map and think about vulnerable jobs, these are people with some skills already. These are people who have career experience. They have many of those employability or soft skills that we think about. Um, these are going to be positions when we look at what's been lost because of COVID-19 and what will be further lost because of automation. These will be positions in office support fields, in food services, in customer service and sales, in production work. Um, 
you know who's not going to be affected as much are people in digital tech and in STEM. And the reason is because those skills are so in demand. We have such huge talent gaps as we look at what we need, both in the greater Washington region, across the United States, and across the globe. I think what's really um, sort of a good news, bad news of COVID-19 is that uh, we now have an ability because everyone's locked in their house, you now have an ability to think about how you source your talent just a little differently. And so uh, where before we might've taken a very regional lens on our markets, we have an ability to think a little creatively about where we get that talent from. So this, I love this slide because this really describes um, what is happening in terms of skills-based demand in the labor market. So to be clear about what this is, this is, this is the greater Washington region that we, are, that we are looking at right now. So if you look at that and say, that doesn't look like where I live, it's because you're probably not living in the greater Washington region, which we define as that space between Baltimore and Richmond. So it includes Washington, DC, and then the MSAs that encompass Baltimore and Richmond as well. And what you see on the left side, I'm gonna explain this to you because I, I think this is a great chart, but it does require a little bit of voiceover. So on the left-hand side, we have the top 100 in-demand skills by growth and demand in tech and tech adjacent occupations. So these are occupations that are predominantly considered STEM fields or occupations that maybe use some of those tech fields, but they aren't necessarily based in a STEM major. So think about financial services, people who need to use some kind of digital tech um, ability, but don't actually have to be STEM majors. This can be the same with HR. It can be the same with communications professionals who are using analytics to really understand um, how to assess usage on their websites. So that's what tech adjacent means in this context. On the right hand side, we have the growth for all other occupations. So everything that doesn't include digital tech. And when you look at these skills, I think there's some pretty um, interesting findings that we're seeing in terms of both changes in labor demand and also just the sheer number of position descriptions that we're seeing. One is that a lot of those skills that have those biggest bubbles are things that we don't necessarily consider hard skills. So you can see they're coded as what we call common skills. These are employability skills, soft skills, um, essential learning outcomes. There's a lot of different names for these things. Um, but when you look at them, these aren't necessarily things that you would um, always think about as, as a hard skill. Then you have these very, very hard skills around uh, cybersecurity, cloud computing. And then finally you have, and, and you look at that red dot, that qualifications piece, you definitely have, so you have the BSN, which is required if you want to be a nurse. Right? But there's all these other jobs that actually aren't requiring necessarily that you have a hard degree. And so as we think then about this movement and this opportunity in the future to move towards skills-based hiring, I get very, very excited because I think employers are really grappling with how do we do this effectively? How do we know when potential employees or current employees actually have a certain set of skills? And, and I think that they are going to be increasingly committed to finding a workforce that has the very specific skills and not, not, not necessarily the degree qualifications that they're accustomed to looking for. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Steve, because you've done so much work on thinking about these employability skills. Um, and I think they need to hear your voiceover on that piece. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think just to, to piggyback off of what you said, Jeannie, the, the marrying of digital literacy skills or these digital tech skills, both at the generalist level, but then in specialized fields like AI machine learning or cyber or cloud computing, um, along with these essential employability skills is going to be critical for people to be successful, not just in the workplace, but in this new distributed or remote environment. So if we think about, uh, and, and this is just building off some recent uh, work that I've done, if we think about really these two different populations that are sitting in the workforce right now, we've got digital natives who are a younger population, they're comprised of millennials, Gen Z, some Gen X, uh, Gen Xers, and then we have what are called digital immigrants. And these are our baby boomers and people who are at the early end of the Gen X population. Digital natives come to the workforce um, with, they're, they're highly talented. They come with uh, high digital literacy. They've grown up their entire lives, you know, working with multiple apps on multiple devices every day, uh, but they don't have the experience in the workforce to necessarily have acquired all of these essential employability skills living in that digital environment. And then we think about these digital immigrants, the older population who didn't grow up with technology but have been in the workforce for most of their life. 
and they've had opportunities to acquire and demonstrate and practice these essential employability skills, but are maybe learning some of the new technologies, so they're, they're still acquiring some mastery or digital literacy. Um, as we think about skills-based hiring and a skills-based environment, there's a real opportunity here for both digital natives and digital immigrants to work alongside and learn alongside one another in this new remote environment or distributed workplace so that our digital natives can take their digital literacy skills and they can sort of coach our, our digital immigrants or the, the generation who's been in the workforce for quite a while but is new to the digital technologies coming out. And at the same time, those digital natives can also learn and sort of um, emulate some of the essential employability skills that this uh, are, are sort of more mature workers uh, have been able to acquire or demonstrate and practice over time. So I think it's, it's going to be critical, especially for talent leaders, for learning and development professionals, to really find cohesive strategies that marry the best of both worlds, that take the strengths of your, your younger, uh, maybe newer emergent workers, and marry those with the population of workers that you have who can help them maybe take a step back, uh, think about the digital technology they're using in the workplace, but think about how to use that technology in a team-based learning environment and working environment. Or take a step back and really critically think about what it means to use technology uh, and, and think ahead to other problems that you don't just wanna jump into to something and act, right? You wanna take a step back, reflect, uh, Taking that pause moment is what I like to tell my students, like just take that pause moment. Think for a minute before you act. And sometimes it's okay to uh, wait 24 hours, right? Before you're gonna send that email. And this is something that our, our um, more mature generation, the baby boomers and Gen X, um, I think that they do this really well. They're able to uh, take a little bit of time. They're able to think uh, more critically about some of these decisions, whereas I think our younger generation, they're used to that just-in-time, fast-paced um, digital environment where you want to just hit send on an email. And both can learn from one another. And so I think uh, marrying these essential employability skills with digital literacy will be key for all generations in the workforce moving forward. Excellent. Um, so now we're, I'm going to stop our screen share and we're going to have a few moderated discuss, uh, discussion questions and then um, I will uh, open the webinar up for Q&A from uh, the audience. So very excited. I think I've already seen the comments in the chat, um, which is great to see you all participating. Um, so the first question will go to Steve. Uh, Steve, your firm specializes in helping employers and educators build new models that help people with complex lives keep learning so that they can move to better, into better jobs over time. What do you see happening in the labor market right now? Which jobs have gone away for good? And what are the emerging jobs? Yeah, so in the labor market right now, uh, as I sort of mentioned earlier, there is this shift towards skills-based hiring. Uh, and employers, especially when we're thinking about talent development, uh, training and development, and tuition assistance type benefits, uh, employers are really wanting an immediate return on investment. Uh, so I think it, it, you're harder pressed now to find an employer who's saying, we, we need somebody to acquire a certain set of skills and we're going to send them back to school. And in four to six years, they'll get a degree and they'll acquire the skills and then they'll bring them back into the workplace and success, right? No, we're seeing a shift now much more toward upskilling and reskilling workers um, in, in almost immediate uh, timeframes. We're talking days and weeks, not months and years. And at a price point that reflects that short-term skills-based type training. Um, so if we think about what employers are looking for, and what employees should be looking for or incumbent or uh, dislocated workers for that matter should be looking for are low cost, very quick opportunities that are skills focused that can get them just what they need to get the job in the market, position them for success and, and be competitive, but can also stack or build into further learning down the road. Um, so I think 
you know, skills-based or skills-focused training, low cost, short term, uh, that, that's what I'm seeing the need for among workers, but there's also that desire among talent leaders or learning and development professionals. Uh, thinking about the jobs that have changed in the labor market. Uh, so jobs that are going away, obviously, are those that can be automated. It's more of the process oriented jobs. Um, it's things like, you know, in a manufacturing uh, line, there are things that computers can do. They can move widgets. They can do quality assurance. A, a computer, for example, can detect a crack in a pipe much more than a, the human eye can. Um, and so pushing quality assurance through maybe a, a more automated technology driven process rather than having a human look at every widget or every pipe or every part that moves through a line, that's something that can be automated away. Um, we're looking at things that are more task oriented being automated like cashiers or dispatchers or drivers even. Um, and so if we think about the, the skills, especially those essential employability skills that are going to be in high demand moving forward, it's critical thinking, right? It's adaptability, it's innovation, it's reasoning and problem solving. A, a computer on a line may know what to do in terms of inspecting parts or moving parts through a line, detecting when there's a problem, but it may not be able to solve that problem. So you're still going to need people who are upskilling, who previously may have worked on the manufacturing line, but now they need, need new digital skills to run the machines, to work on the machines that are doing the monotonous task-oriented work. Uh, and that's something that, that's, that's a job that will be increasingly in demand as machines become more complex and they are computer driven. You need people to operate and teach the machines what they need to be doing as well. So I think, again, focusing really on these employability skills that I shared earlier, those are the things that machines and AI cannot necessarily solve for, at least not all of them all of the time. So embedding those with the digital literacy and tech skills that are going to be needed as things are automated, there's still a role for digital tech and critical thinking or employability skills when married to lead that movement in automation and technology. Excellent, excellent. Next question is going to go to Jeannie. Jeannie, you spend a lot of your time working with major employers in the greater Washington, D.C. area. What do they do to close the skills gap with new or incumbent employees? So I think Steve is really right to distinguish when we look at, at this workforce, it, it distinguish between new versus incumbent. So when we look at new versus incumbent, you really have very different needs in terms of preparing them for a future of work. And the DC market is a particularly important one. So as we look at the greater Washington footprint, it's a little unusual when you look at the composition of our employers. Um, and that's because we have such a strong federal government presence. So the federal government has its own requirements for what it expects from a workforce. And then it also has a number of defense contractors that it then sort of drags along behind them because it has very specific requirements for what those government contractors can then hire as well. So, so what I will say is that I think that the DC region and the DC market is just a little bit different. And I know that there's a number of people on this call from around the country and around the world. So I do want to give that caveat. Our employers at the Capital Collab are the largest in the region. So employers like Amazon, Cap One, T. Rowe Price, McKinsey, JP Morgan Chase, EY. So we have this really, and though that's just that's just a handful, but I think it's important. We have a really interesting cross section of employers, everywhere from financial services and defense contractors to consulting services and hospital systems. And the question our employers came to when they first sat down um, and said, "What should we work on in the skills and talent space?" is what What is the set of skills that we all need, regardless of what our industry is, where do we know we need to double down in this region in order to be competitive? And it was very quickly decided that digital tech was that space. And as Steve has really capably described, it's not just digital tech in terms of people who are hard coding programs and working in software and working with database administration. It's people who can engage with technology and use technology in their day-to-day -day efforts as well. So for an incumbent workforce, I think we have the opportunity around upskilling and reskilling to make sure we're giving these quick bites of knowledge and expertise. And that's really what these large employers are trying to figure out is how do we find the right providers who can offer at the right price point in the right modalities, right? So 
Is it during the day and you have to be there in person or is it asynchronous online? You can access your education whenever you need. For the new workforce at the CoLab, the way we get about this is a little bit different. So for your average 22 year old who's just beginning to enter the workforce, we actually work very closely with our employers and with our education partners and our education partners are everywhere from K-12 jurisdictions in our region to 19 research ones in the region. So uh, we have a whole gamut of employers and, and then also of education partners and then also community colleges at the table. And what we try to do with that body of work that really translates across all of our efforts is make sure that we're addressing this complaint that we always hear from both employers and educators that say, I don't know what the other one wants. And so we hear this all the time where employers will say, I'm not getting what I need from education. And educators will say, well, employers aren't telling me what they need. And so then you get this kind of thing happening, right? That actually doesn't solve anyone's purpose at all. And, and so what we try to do is nip that in the bud. And we do that by asking our employers to sit around a table and in very painstaking fashion, they get very, very granular about what are all the learning outcomes that they need that they need to see in a workforce that is coming in, whether it's a new workforce or an incumbent workforce. What are the things that employees need to know? Then through the CoLab, we provide those very long lists of skills back to educators and we say, now it's on you. Now you know. So we're removing those barriers to communication. And oftentimes what's fascinating about this work, and I know Jeff knows this because he's living and breathing it, is people are often saying really the same things, they're just using different vocabulary. And so as we're trying to engage in this translational work, making sure that educators are educating in a way that employers recognize, making sure that students are able to articulate the skills and abilities that they're actually learning and can then reflect them to employers. And then employers are able to say, why yes, of course, I'm getting exactly what I need from this ecosystem. I just didn't realize that the language being used was perhaps not what I was recognizing in the workforce. And those pieces I think become really key as we do this work and allow our largest employers to both help define how we need to engage in a skills-based conversation, but also then to more rapidly hire those people that have the skills that they need. Excellent, so Jean, you, you mentioned um, working with some of the largest employers in the region. What about the small and medium employers that might not necessarily have that direct access to educators? How are they, how are you observing that they are approaching the skills gap or at least the gap um, in knowledge of how skills are translated? This, this is the issue for any group that's trying to do regional workforce development. And the reason is because we know that 80% of employers in the greater Washington region are actual, actually small and medium sized employers. It's not the biggest ones, it's everyone else who's trying to find their talent that can fill their open positions. And what we know is that the smaller companies tend to have a harder time finding that talent. It takes them longer to fill open positions, it takes them longer to find the most qualified candidates, and that's because often they just don't have the same resources and the same HR mechanisms in place. So what we see happening, first and foremost, the way we work at the Capital CoLab is we're trying to build a digital tech ecosystem that is diverse and at scale. So we're not looking to just provide digital tech talent to the employers that are officially part of CoLab. We're trying to change the way we think about digital tech talent in this region. And that means everyone's going to benefit from it because our small and medium-sized employers are going to be able to access those students who are graduating from our community colleges, who are graduating from our four-year institutions, who are graduating not just from Georgetown University, but from Bowie State, from Virginia Commonwealth, from all of these institutions all around our region, and they'll be able to then access the talent that they need. So that's really key. I think we also oftentimes, um, we know that many of our students don't wanna go work at the biggest employers. So does everyone wanna go work at Northrop Grumman? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, maybe they actually are more interested in the startup culture. And so we're really trying to, one of the reasons for this work and why we do it is because we want to make sure that we're giving a shot in the arm to this entire digital tech ecosystem and that we're ensuring that the people who are living in our region are able to continue working in this region and have strong career paths that allow them to earn a livable wage what we, and, and what we call a family sustaining wage. So what I get excited about when I see how small and medium sized employers are pivoting in this space is that I think employees are excited about them. And that allows them often, one, to just ride on the wave of enthusiasm that they're seeing, but also they can sometimes be more agile as they think about accessing non-traditional education providers 
And so many of these small and medium sized firms might be able to think and act and push the boundaries a little more aggressively than some of our some of our other largest employers are really able to do because of many of the historical legacies that they have in place for how they do HR systems, or maybe they're just very comfortable with their HR recruiting pipelines. So there are certainly challenges for small and medium sized employers, and I don't want to minimize those because I, I think that they are real. Um, but I think there's also real opportunity for small and medium sized employers to engage in this conversation and to push the envelope and teach the rest of us how to do it really well. Excellent, excellent. So uh, Steve, Jeannie mentioned a variety of different um, institutions, um, colleges that kind of range from, I guess, the big names to community colleges um, to a couple of HBCUs that are in the area. How do you feel these institutions or do you feel that these institutions are addressing the skills gap? Yes, so um, this also pairs well with a question that we had in the Q&A box just now about how are the skills measured and demonstrated or verified to employers. Uh, so your, your question, Jackie, you know, colleges and universities, uh, this is something that I, I've spent many years working in colleges and universities, but also at the American Council on Education uh, in the, the center there representing colleges and universities and really focusing on teaching and learning innovation. And one of the things I've really focused on with colleagues who are in the faculty development and teaching and learning space recently is um, uh, this focus on uh, discipline. So faculty's discipline and how they can make disciplinary connections, not just to the discipline itself, but to these broader based employability skills more apparent through the learning experience and more apparent to students so that students know what they're learning, they know when and how they learned it, and then can communicate that to employers. So for example, if, uh, if you're a student in a statistics class and you're a statistics faculty, you may not necessarily think about your, your math discipline or your statistics discipline as something that you're teaching people broader based skills that can be used out in the workplace or in the workforce. But really, when you're teaching statistics, you're helping somebody think critically to go out in the world and make sense of information that's presented to them. This day and age, we live in a politically charged environment. You hear a lot of numbers thrown at you. You see different statistics on TV every day, depending on what channel you watch. And Within a statistics class, a faculty member has a real opportunity to drill down to the skill level and say, I'm not just teaching you problem solving. I'm teaching you how to make sense of the world, make sense of information. So next time you see a statistic, come back to what you're learning in the classroom, start to think about the information that's presented to you, distill down and start to, to really understand the world around you, call out, information that doesn't appear right, seek further information. Uh, it, and it all stems from teaching students more transparently and overtly what it is uh, they're learning beyond just the disciplinary connection in the classroom. And that's where I think faculty, yes, colleges and universities, yes, um, they have a, an, a role and an obligation to students to help them identify skills gaps and then close those skill gaps uh, and not just within an academic setting. It has to be translatable to a workplace or a life and career relevant setting, not just an academic classroom setting. And so that's where I say, you know, if you teach history, you have an amazing opportunity right now to relate current events to historical events and help people think very critically about their actions and the way that they're engaging with society now, how that's impacted by and how that impacts uh, what, what happens now and in the future by drawing these very clear connections. And I, I think faculty are, are well positioned to do that and to, to carry the mantle in this regard because research shows that faculty in that academic setting have the most significant influence on students' outcomes and on student learning, more so than any other campus support or any other academic uh, structure or uh, system uh, that's in place. 
so faculty have a role and an obligation in the classroom to make these very specific overt connections outside of the classroom as well. Excellent. Um, Jeff, uh, and in full disclosure to the audience, Jeff and I both work for Sailor Academy, of course. Um, so Jeff, um, Steve was talking about how uh, this is being addressed within, um, within higher education. Um, and certainly there's a growing market of providers um, that are helping individuals that may not have the time or money to invest in uh, a traditional degree program or, um, or go back to or go into um, higher education in order to be able to upskill. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the alternative providers, this market of alternative providers, and what is Sailor Academy's unique um, value proposition in it? What other opportunities are available to learners? Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the great, the good news is there's probably more opportunities for upscaling digitally than any other time in human history, right? We didn't have the internet forever. Now we have this plethora of people of organizations that can offer you all kinds of skills from very, very discreet things to big picture things. So of course, with all that choice comes problems because who is who, right? And all those kinds of important questions. But I want to step back to both Jeannie and Steve mentioned uh, these, you know, both kind of the, the sets of skills that kind of come together, right? The hard skills and the employable, transferable, uh, essential skills. I love that essential skills. A lot of people love them soft skills, but you're right, they're, they're hard in their own way and essential uh, for sure. But overall, the, you know, on the people, it's, you know, a lot of people understand the hard skills. It's, it's a concept we're all familiar with and get hit with a lot. Um, you know, coding, C++, Python, all those sorts of things. Lots of providers out there from Coursera, who of course partners and edX, who partners with academic institutions to bring more focused short-term learning opportunities. Uh, you got Code Academy, you got Udacity, very high-end stuff, Code Academy for beginners, and lots of things in between. There's now uh, academies popping up in graphic, uh, graphic design, in um, sales. The radio industry has put together a, a sales program where if you don't have a background, go get a sales training and you're qualified for interviews at a bunch of different radio stations. It's just kind of an interesting niche thing that, that is popping up uh, across the country. But in all these areas, uh, you know, the digital gap, in particular in the DC area and other places, we have a lot of needs in cybersecurity and data science. And if some people are worried about, well, who are these providers and, and how do we know if they're any good? Well, the good news in some of these areas, like in uh, cybersecurity, you know, uh, CompTIA has been around for decades and has been working with employers for decades. And they have multiple short, focused, very relevant uh, security credentials that can be obtained relatively affordable um, and relatively quickly. Uh, and so lots of different places out there. Obviously, you mentioned higher ed, they've got continuing ed programs. Community colleges uh, have great continuing ed programs in different areas as well. So there's a great bunch of opportunity out there. Uh, you can also, if you're if trying to figure out who's who, you know, what one big thing is to look at, well, who are these providers partnering with, right? Uh, if Coursera, you know, a lot of them have, so if you take this, uh, and Udacity in particular, take this series of courses and you get an interview with Intel or whoever. Now, that's at the high level, but of course at the other level is who are the gatekeepers? So for example, we've partnered recently with a very large uh, national union that's telling its employees who are, some, some of them are, or excuse me, as it tells its members, some of who are out of work, some of who are in danger of being out of work. Uh, you know, here's a place to go get uh, some, some, some uh, credentials. Your, your local libraries now are doing a lot of this vetting as well, right? Libraries are partnering with Linux.com and others for, for skills. For sort of thing. So lots of opportunity out there to, to get hard skills quickly. And there's also roads to different things, right? Remember there are stackable uh, credentials and those, are, those can be seen in different ways. So for example, Steve mentioned the BSN in nursing. Well, there's a tremendous national need in, in a, for uh, nurses at general nurses aides and, and certified nurses aides, CNAs, GNAs, and certified medicine aides. Those are critical jobs and shortage that if you get the training quickly, six, eight weeks, you can probably get a job pretty quickly in your own area. Uh, and then now you're working with nurses every day, and then you can start continuing to get your next credential after that. So one of the great thing about, you know, trying to reskill and upskill, if you're not an incumbent, if you're trying to get back in, whether it's your first job or you're re-envisioning yourself, if you're a 
Someone mentioned Gen Xers and baby boomers. I'm a Gen Xer myself, uh, higher end, but but not quite a boomer. Um, but uh, you know, so luck, you know, I've, luckily, uh, I've got a great job. But you never know. You never know if you have to reskill quickly. There are lots of opportunities. So, and tying in those hard skills, of course, with the essential skills. One thing we've done in particular, back in 2012, we made a, 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 a commitment with the Clinton Global Initiative to build out uh, courses related to those skills. And if you could go back to Steve's slide for a moment, uh, there, a lot of these things have been important forever, but now they're really coming to the fore. Where he's talking about critical thinking and all these different, different really broad but important essential skills, communication, decision making, problem solving, teamwork, leadership. We actually have a core, a digital, we actually offer digital credentials in every one of these areas. Uh, a couple of them are, 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 are built into schools, but almost all of these we have a specific digital credential for. And we're finding university partners of course, uh, around the world. <clears throat> for example, in India, we've actually partnered with the National Skills Development Corporation, which is a tremendous national effort that we would love to see replicated here in the US. We see a lot of regional things, of course, which are important like collab and different things. But India has done this national approach and it's a very big country, so, so it can be done in a big place with the National Skills Development Course. We're now a knowledge partner and we're offering certificates in all these areas. So what's happening too, where you might go to, in the old days, you would go to the old days of two years ago <laughs> or 20 even, you would go to university and maybe get all your education there, right? In one of your four to six, whatever it is, your period. Well, now you might get, you might be at Code Academy learning some basics while you're getting something from edX, but also maybe take some certificates from us and others to, to shore up some of these employability skills. You might have them, they're probably in your resume. If you pull out what you've been working on, you could probably think about how you can demonstrate your teamwork and leadership and different things. But also, uh, you know, we've got, uh, Jeannie mentioned learning outcomes. We're very detailed and very focused on learning outcomes. We get those both from the private sector and public sectors, as well as of course academics and try to merge those two. So we've, we've, we've really tried to hit the key learning outcomes in all these areas that we're mentioning here. So you can get a, a variety, put together a portfolio now of short digital credentials that add up to show you a way to augment some of your experience if you've been in the workforce for a while or to show that you are capable of, of learning, which is very important, right? Uh, so, um, which a lot of these things lead to, as Steve was talking about in the statistics example and others. So there's this great opportunity to merge and bring these areas together, hard skills uh, and the transferable skills. Yeah, for example, I said some of the universities in India are now sending their students to us to get these digital credentials. And they're, they're popping up across the, you know, the US and other international workforce. For example, Skillsoft has, has issued over 3 million digital credentials just in the last 12 months. So they're proliferating and, and, and these, these types of things are getting out there. HR, you know, CEOs have known about this for a while and been pushing this, but sometimes it takes a while. As Jeannie mentioned, a lot of places have really entrenched HR processes and, and if the HR person went to college and the degree makes sense for a while, it takes, it takes some time to, to get uh, uh, some of these new credentials in the mix. But now we're seeing it both out of, um, you know, both out of the trend, but as, as everybody's mentioned, this now just fast forward acceleration that COVID put on the gas of, uh, of moving things in this direction. So, you know, again, lots of people out there doing good stuff. You, of course, want to be careful. Um, if someone has a really high price, you really want to see what you're getting for it. But there's a lot of people out there offering low, pro, low, low cost, quality stuff that you can kind of bundle together and put yourself, you know, a portfolio. And speaking of portfolios, one more thing to do, too, for those entering the workforce is think about the gig economy and freelancing just to go out and um, hire, get yourself, you know, we have a customer service uh, certificate program. You can learn some customer service skills. You probably already have them, but now you can really, really show you have them. And you know there are tons and tons of uh, small companies that can't afford a big customer service department that would hire people 10, 20 hours a week to get those skills going. Uh, and you could, you could put together a portfolio of different types of skills and projects and endorsements that are public on some of these freelance sites that you can bring together with so your portfolio of, of work, with your portfolio of credentials, and take those into the workplace even when you are an incumbent who's trying to move up. So I'll stop for there because I know there's kind of a big landscape to cover, but um, just lots of opportunity out there. 
that that really kind of bode well for all the important issues that our panelists are raising. Uh, G, are you seeing larger employers utilize um, alternative providers and why or why not? That's a complicated question. Um, and, and the reason is because what we see with our large employers is some of it is very, very cultural and very, very pragmatic. So the question often comes comes down to the, for them to do we build or do we buy? And so many of them, with the largest employers, actually have very robust internal systems that allow them to actually build their own alternative training content. And then there's others who say, you know what, we're agnostic as to building or buying, and, and we're just going to find the best content out there and figure out what makes the most sense. And then you have a group that says, we'll buy it. We don't need to build it. We don't need to have that in-house capacity. Uh, and so and so we're just going to go find those providers out there that do it. So I think it really, it really depends. It also depends on the industry that those largest employers are in. Um, a piece that came up though that I think is really key is this notion of stackable credentials. And so what I will say, and this is with my with my policy hat on, and as we think about building a diverse ecosystem of talent, is making sure that we move students through a pipeline that allows them to stack these towards something else. So skills-based learning and skills-based hiring, it sounds a little fatty right now. It sounds a little jargony. It sounds a little like, oh, it's the new wave of the future. And so I happen to believe in it. I happen to believe that skills-based hiring is where we should be going. I also am very sensitive as we think about equipping an entire workforce with both the skills they need and the credentials that are reflecting those skills because the credentials, to Jeff's point, People in HR systems often went through college themselves and have an expectation for what those credentials are going to look like. In the DC market, the reality is in digital tech, even though you hear this vernacular all the time, not everyone needs to go to college and you don't need to have a college degree to work in tech. In the greater Washington market, that is not the case. That's just not the case. The data do not support this story that you don't need to go to college in order to work in digital tech. There are a small, especially, especially by the way, if you want to earn a family sustaining wage and be in an in-demand field. So if you want to actually have a career in digital, in digital tech, the data really shows that you do need to go to college. And so what we know is that people don't go through in quite the same way anymore. It's a lot less likely that you're going to go through in four years. It's much more likely, you know, the traditional student is now over the age of 22, is a part-time student, might be married, might be taking care of elder parents, might have children, might have all of, might be working full-time, right? Has all of these other factors. So while we may expect that it's not a traditional pathway, the reality is at the end of it, we still want people to have some of those credentials, especially in digital tech, because our employers want both. That's the reality is they want those skills, but, but to give yourselves the security of knowing that you're going to be employable in the future, I would always recommend that you also get those college degrees that go along with those skills so that no one can question what is it you know, because I do think skills-based hiring is the future, uh, but some, some employers are not going down that route. And, and let's be honest, the federal government can be slow to change. And the federal government in the greater Washington footprint is driving a lot of this conversation around what you need in order to be employable in digital tech. So especially in our work, as we think about inclusive growth and how to make sure that we're building a diverse digital tech ecosystem, this piece becomes really key. And so I just felt the need to get on my soapbox there for just a minute around stackable credentials and to, and to really say we need to make sure that we are tying all of this skills work into pieces of, of content and recognition of knowledge that makes sense to many of the systems that are already in place. Um, the final piece that I do just want to highlight is this question that ties to this when you look at alternative providers, which is, which, which comes first, tech skills or employability skills? And it's this really fun conversation. And like this question of do employers use alternative providers, the answer on this question is also pretty nuanced because it depends. If they are hardcore tech companies, what we find is that even when it comes to upskilling, they're looking at people who can do the tech. They're looking at people who have STEM backgrounds, who can document that they actually have those very hard skills. In a lot of the other industries though, we're seeing that especially for the upskilling and reskilling of their incumbent workforce, they're looking for those people who can demonstrate that they're adaptable, who can demonstrate that they're resilient, who if you put them into training programs, especially in digital tech, are going to actually thrive and be successful. 
So this is a really interesting shift that we're seeing and a, and a great conversation that our employers are engaging in very, very actively. And it really speaks to the need as we look at skills-based hiring to have modules of content that on the one hand can offer some of those essential skills, but on the other can also get to those digital tech skills. So depending on where employers sit, in their, in their industry and where employees are in terms of where they wanna go, they can access either one. Because I think this is, this is really key that when it comes to an incumbent workforce, there's no one size fits all. Can I add on to that real quick, Jeannie? Of course. One thing is we also need employers at all levels to sort of um, walk the talk, right? In, in my experience talking with people who are at sort of the talent leader level, they'll say skills-based hiring is definitely where we're going. Then you talk to somebody who's a line manager or a hiring manager, and they're still looking for that degree as the indicator of quality for a candidate. Now, whether that degree is actually necessary to do the job is irrelevant. They're looking at that as this veil of quality, that if I hire somebody with a degree in X, there's a, there's a certainty that I, I almost have cover, that if I hire them and they, they don't quite perform, I can still say, well, they had a degree. So I, I had some assurance that they could do the job, as opposed to the more um, uncertain skills-based hiring market where you say, somebody's coming to me and they maybe have demonstrated on GitHub that they can code a certain thing and their peers have thumbs up it or plus one it, whatever platform you're using. Uh, and so their validated skills without the credential, that's, that's a little more uncomfortable for employers or at least for hiring managers to get there. So it sounds good as a corporate strategy to say skills-based hiring is where we're going but that needs to align with the practice on the ground at the hiring manager level. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to move away from degree as a proxy for quality or credential as a proxy for quality. Can I jump in? Please. Yeah, I want to uh, tack on to both. I wrote both some really great points. Um, you know, stackable credentials, what we're seeing too on both sides, is we are seeing a little bit more of, of the talk that Jean, Jean, Jeannie was mentioning earlier happening between employers uh, as you know, people are seeing that, universities are seeing that, employers are recognizing, for example, as one example in cybersecurity, CompTIA, Cisco, and other types of certifications as legitimate uh, proxies. But now those universities and through uh, Steve's old employer, uh, the American Council on Education, have now mapped those to degree requirements. So you, so now some of your certifications are knocking out um, credits to get that degree. And what's interesting now, in addition, you know, in addition to alternative skills-based providers, there's also alternative general, um, uh, general elective and general education and, and liberal arts education providers as well. And so now you, some of the most innovative uh, universities like Southern New Hampshire University and Western Governors that are very large nonprofits, so keeping debt down, are allowing you to keep debt down even further by one, recognizing certifications that can get you that maybe first job, get you moving up while you're used going to school at night. As, as Jeannie mentioned, hardly any, you know, the big trend is going, getting your degree later and you know, maybe not even starting until 24, but finishing in 28, 29, 30, or even later. Um, and so these stackable credentials are happening in a lot of areas. You know, the LPN, you don't need a degree for, but you get a, get a job with an LPN and then, then that takes you into the BSN, right? And, and on up. And so you see that in a bunch of different areas. And then talking about the great thing that's happening too, and I'm, but I do worry about a disconnect that's out there that's got potential to exacerbate some of the inequitable stuff, inequity that we talked about uh, because of not just COVID, but because of the structural inequity we have in our society but there are now a lot of assessments happening at the workplace. So when you show up, you might say, oh yeah, I, I've, I was coding on GitHub. Okay, here's a C++ exam, show me what you can do. Well, that might be great for a lot of people and there's a bunch of those assessments happening across a number of areas, uh, including some that are more um, cognitive and psychological based, right? But um, so what I worry about is just these exams being put out without a clear roadmap on how I get the skills to prep for those exams that employers are using, right? So we want to, as, so as more employers are using these assessments to, to test uh, qualifications, sometimes they'll just, they don't care if you've got the qualification, if you can pass their assessment. 
but hopefully those assessments are covering the same things that degree programs and alternative uh, other providers and educators are providing too. Otherwise, you're going to have another another disconnect that's going to perpetuate some of the problems we've seen down the line. But so the stackable world gives me a lot of hope because of what we see in a couple of very specific areas. Uh, you know, for example, in the, in the G DC area, I'm not, no affiliation, but but we work with that. We just became allies with them, um, not partners, but allies. Uh, Statistics.com has a robust data science uh, program that you learn top level stuff in Python and regression analysis. And it's really interesting stuff. That is also, the whole program is, is uh, recognized by ACE. So you can actually get a whole year's worth of high level stuff, including your final, some of your final year requirements. Uh, that, but also probably get a job just based on what you had. Their work, you know, they work with employers uh, to be instructors as well. So you have that tie-in. So again, when you're looking at programs out there, who are these? Who are these? Uh, who are these um, providers affiliated with? Right? For Sailor, we affiliate with a lot of universities around the country uh, and, and some employers as well. Uh, but um, you're seeing more of that. So all those, you know, the stackable piece, the assessment piece that Steve mentioned and the demonstrate the demonstrative piece, the proxy piece, all come together in what policymakers uh, that Jeannie's working with and others, and Steve's working with them too, and people at chambers and different things have to do is when we look to new things, whether they're assessments or credentials or whatever, are we now reimagining things in a way that also reimagines things to eliminate and minimize some of the inequities based on gender, race, poverty background, et cetera, that we've had uh, we seem so exacerbated because of the low skill jobs are the ones, I hate to say that word because all jobs are skilled, but, but the low digital skilled jobs are a lot of the ones that are um, being eliminated or have been shut down because of COVID. So now these folks need to either upskill, get new things. So, so let's, let's find a way to get a lot, of pe lot more people. You know, a cybersecurity job with a credential from a community college short of a degree could still be a $50,000 to $90,000 career pathway. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have money to go purchase the degree <laughs> after that and keep going. So the great thing again, is there are, you know, healthcare, digital, et cetera, lots of path, a lot of, lots of affordable entry points. So the key is, is, you know, can, can people like uh, the Greater Washington Partnership and others in the regions focus some uh, information for the workforce so they can find a place to learn what are my pathways that are legitimate affordable and and how quickly can I get there? So very, you know, very key topics, both on the stackable and as well as the assessment piece and, and the, the proxy. So I just wanted to piggyback on that. Jackie, what else you got? Well, hold on, I must I must jump in, Jeff. I must, because <laughs> you teed it up. It's, you must have been reading my mind and that is we are launching an employer signaling system for ah. the greater Washington region that does exactly what you're saying. So it's in beta right now. We're working with our five K-12 community college and post-secondary jurisdictions to refine it and we'll release it in the fall. But what it does is in digital tech at least, outlines very specifically, what are the opportunities? What's the labor market shortage? And, and what do you need to know? in yeah. each of these various pathways in order to actually be competitive in that space. So maybe we can come back for another webinar and do a little walkthrough in the fall when it's when it's public and, and available for mass consumption. We'd love to share it. So, so, just, so just, for that, just for the audience, when, when do you see that going live or at least in beta? It's supposed to go live in the fall. So it's in beta now. So we can we can actually do a walkthrough at any time because um, it's pretty good. It's really pretty good. And That's we'll great. release it to all of our partners in the fall. That's exciting, great. Excellent. And so, Steve, um, in your previous um, in your previous uh, career, you uh, were working with uh, regionally accredited uh, institutions. How do you see them fitting into this conversation? With how do you see them working with alternative providers? Do you see them embracing the stackable of credentials? Do you see them getting involved with programs um, such as uh, the GW part, the Greater Washington Partnerships? employer signaling where where do you see that acceptance yeah and, and i'll try to keep this brief um take off my faculty hat so uh you know i think the use of alternative credentials and providers will grow simply because it's a matter of decreasing time to completion and decreasing the cost of a degree so as long as these alternative providers and credentials can stack into a degree i certainly think there'll be growth and that's going to be driven by 
working learners who are more cost conscious consumers of a set post-secondary education. Um, I think for institutions, especially as, as a result of COVID and declining enrollments, they will look to a new pipeline of potential learners to come to their institution. And I think that those will be working learners. Those will be learners who are bringing some experience or other types of credentials and they'll need to get credit for that. And I think in institutions of higher ed will really need to embrace prior learning assessment and credit for prior learning uh, to recognize the work-based learning that occurs and to recognize what one knows and can do when they come to the institution. Uh, and what really matters for institutions and for policymakers right now is that we look at and establish common sense, learner-centered uh, policies and practices that can help learners um, especially working learners, optimize the skills that they have and the abilities that they've demonstrated. Excellent. And, and Jeff, one more question for you. Given um, how this landscape is changing, and um, you had mentioned that before that Sailor Academy had pivoted to uh, more skills-focused professional development offerings in 2012, um, how do you see uh, Sailor's offerings changing? Um, where, what other areas do you think Sailor will go into? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, we got to follow the trends that the, our panelists have been talking about. Um, and being, being a nimble organization where we can really focus on the learning and not have to, um, we are going to continue to do a lot of uh, short courses in key areas, you know, just introductions and some, some, and also some that go in depth. So, you know, look for things in cloud computing and and blockchain uh, and those sorts of important things just so people at least get a flavor of. So if they're working with someone else who's an expert in that, when they go into a company, they can have that conversation and be able to interact with them. But also more detailed things. We, and this fall, we'll be having uh, some extended courses coming out in data management, data visualization, and those sorts of hard areas. But it's it also going to continue to break out in some of the some of the uh, transferable employability skills. So by the end of the summer, we should have courses on how to do presentations. Uh, and then also for those people who are trying to create something, we're also going to have a new course in and how to get a grant. <laughs> you know, and so how to apply for grants. So lots of different skills out there. We worked with Thomas Edison State University a few years ago to actually map out the competencies in a <clears throat> in a liberal arts gen ed program which is kind of interesting right because a lot of blood when people think about competency-based education they think about well you know you think about these harder skills but they were they, they found a way to map uh the competencies in uh you know gen ed programs and so you know so that's where this some of these course names popping up from presentations and uh, grant writing come from the program we from the work we did we actually uh, matched up open education resources, got to do a plug there. Open education resources are really important because those resources can help providers uh, find ways to get some of the education and background uh, for some of the competencies and skills when Jeannie says, what are employees looking for? Uh, I, I, you know, the more open ed and open ed resources that we can build as a, as a larger community public private partnerships, the more other trainers out there can latch onto them and use them. Uh, so, for example, you know, we had a company in Pakistan uh, adopt a whole series of our courses that required every employee to take them in their own mini academy inside their inside their um, company. And we see that now in other, other places as well. So, again, following the trend of quicker, shorter focus, uh, but also the fundamental things, you know, digital analytics. You might not have to be the digital, you might not have to be a digital scientist in 2021 and 2022. But you better be able to analyze and think about it, as Steve mentioned, and present it. And so someone else might be doing the number crunching, but you need to understand it and be able to explain it to somebody. So um, all those types of things we'll continue to, to focus on. And, and uh, we're really excited to learn more about what's happening. You know, I, I, we, were, we were there at the CoLab kickoff a year and a half ago. And, and so it's very exciting to see that beta in place and, and Ed to Works involved in that and other things. So lots of great things happening. Um, for people. And so I know it's tough times, but I think we want to close on optimism because you got really smart people like these two out there working on stuff and, and they're harnessing a bunch of other people uh, that are talented as well. So people are trying to figure it out. Um, and so, and a lot of it's coming online very quickly uh, to get all, you know, Jeannie mentioned that the, the, the Greater Wash Partnership, that 
a lot of people at the table and to get something from, hey, let's hear an idea, let's get to the table now of a beta in a pretty short time period that hopefully goes live this fall. That is a great, uh, you know, great success. And we want, want to see more nimble things like that in the market. And, you know, we're happy to work on open education resources with any kinds of programs like that that are out there that we don't, you know, we don't even need to be involved, but we can use them ourselves to, to share uh, individual certificates as well, because we offer our stuff to people around the world, as you know. But um, just lots of great opportunities. So times are tough. Times are really bad for a lot of people. But, uh, you know, get out, you know, get out to your local workforce boards. They've got training centers, uh, your community colleges, your, you know, lots of places that are, of course, come to Sailor. We got some information there, but, but uh, lots of places for people to, to uh, come as, as individuals, but also lots of opportunity for the providers in, in the space to work together. And Steve's been at the forefront of that, bringing uh, universities together with alternative providers with more academic settings. But now we're seeing, we're seeing boot camps come up on campus, right? And now there's digital boot camps. And so a lot of different things are happening uh, where we're seeing market players come together in a much better way. We still have a lot of siloed, right? As Jeannie again mentioned earlier with the crosstalk, now we're starting to break down those silos, bring people together, uh, and hopefully not just address the short run problem, but also again, help uh, correct some of the digit, some of the big inequities and access. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of the big access was access to information, right? And, and so hopefully the news starts talking about community college programs and and, to, and what the uh, people like the Greater Washington Partnership are working on, what Edge Work is working on, so that people can learn about this stuff uh, in a way that uh, has a bit of gatekeeping around it, uh, in a way that they can get have quality signals and all that kind of stuff. So I think we should be optimistic, despite the tough times we're in. Lots of good stuff out there and hopefully more to come. Excellent, excellent. And so now I wanna open, uh, open the webinar up for um, questions and answers. Uh, so feel free to type um, your question into the Q&A portion um, or the chat portion of uh, this webinar. Um, great question. Uh, it looks like Jeannie already posted an answer, but Jeannie, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to read it out. And if you'd like to give your um, answer for feedback, that would be great. Um, so many of the biggest employers have moved quickly toward algorithmic automated resume screening to significantly narrow pools based on keywords, et cetera. Would love to hear the panelists comment on this vis-a-vis -vis the question of skills and certifications versus degrees and non-traditional versus traditional uh, providers. All, also comment on the impact on inclusion. Jeannie? So I, yeah, I responded to this and said it is, it is a real catch-22. Uh, we hear from our employers that they're receiving thousands of applications sometimes for each open position. And these are our largest employers who in theory have the most resources. Um, this makes it very difficult to do anything manually. And so you kind of have to rely on these filters and these mechanisms to get talent to the top of the pile. Um, but it can have a really detrimental effect on inclusion. Um, and I think we need to be aware of that and actively fight that and combat that and build processes and systems into, into our reviews to make sure that we are, we are recognizing that and being explicit about it. Um, another piece I think is making sure that people who are applying for jobs are well equipped to position themselves. And at the CoLab, in addition to having our employers and other employers around the region articulate what it is they need and having educators also then provide um, those skills embedded in their curriculum, we build out work-based learning components. And so we really believe strongly that along the course of an educational pathway, folks need an opportunity to try out what they're learning. Um, that's, this is where we think they're going to learn a lot of those employability skills is in these professional touches along the course of their educational pathway, whether it's when they're in high school or when they're in college. Um, so making sure that it's not just a one-shot deal where if you apply for a job and you don't know how to talk about it, like you'll never get a job, but um, and instead along, along the course of your education, you get better at it um, through these work-based learning touches, I think is, is really key. But I'd love to hear from my co-panelists about their reactions to this, because I think it's tricky. I think it's a really, and, and for full transparency, the person asking that question is the incoming CEO of the Greater Washington Partnership, J.B. Holston, who is no longer on the call, but um, I'd like to know what you all think about this so I can look really smart back at the office. 
Um, yeah, so so I would say a you know when we think about automated you know applicant tracking systems and uh, you know machine readers for resumes, to me what that signals if you're a candidate is you need to learn how to game the system. So you learn how to hide keywords in your resume, you know, in the header or the footer, and and you learn to game the system. And so, short of we need a, a totally different way of hiring and and screening applicants, which that's another story and another day. But um, I think what we can do, and I say the we, you know, on the higher ed side, uh, we can help students, help learners know what they know and communicate it in a way that matters and resonates with employers. One of the things that's phenomenal about the digital tech credential at Greater Washington Partnership and CoLab is that if a student earns a digital tech credential, whether it's through uh, learning the skills in a major or a minor or a certificate at any one of the CoLab partnering universities, that student clearly can articulate the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they have. Because it's been communicated to them what it is they're learning, they know exactly what those demonstrations of learning look like and they can communicate in a way that resonates to employers what they have learned. So they're not just saying I've learned cybersecurity, they're saying these are the elements of cybersecurity I've learned at this level and the level matters and in a way that employers have said, this is how we understand when somebody talks about cybersecurity to us because it's co-developed, those KSAs are co-developed. Now that's specific to digital tech. I think this is where the onus also falls on faculty to help students make explicit connections between what they're learning in the classroom or in a traditional setting and how that relates to a non-academic setting. So how do you relate academic learning into life and career relevant skills so that when you communicate that out in the world, what, what is a learning outcome in an academic setting might be called a skill in the workplace. And there's some translation that needs to happen there and faculty can help students start to make that translation. It also requires a little bit of work on faculty's part for them to learn some of the translational language as well. Excellent, excellent. I'm looking for... Can I, can I just jump in? Absolutely. Yeah, because I think there's also a great point to kind of circle back to something that was mentioned earlier about employers stepping up and providers stepping up as well. And so employers, as, as their panelists have hinted, are doing a better job, but more need to do better in really articulating what it is I need to know to get this job, right? Uh, and then, and so that you can, somebody can say, okay, yeah, here's how I can, I'm gonna highlight that in my resume, hopefully not just by repeating it, but being able to demonstrate where they got it. Uh, and on the other side, you know, for um, providers, as I mentioned, and I think, you know, hopefully everyone's doing this, but we're very learning outcome focused, right? So, so we, what I try, what I see a lot of people just doing on their own when they post our certificates on LinkedIn and add them to resumes, um, and our digital credentials also have these embedded with them. But um, you know, we're very learning outcome focused. So I, I we're encouraging people not just to say you got a C plus uh, plus certification, which is great, but in ours, uh, you know, you also, you know, want, you know, you also learn to um, define and use function arrays, unions, enumerations. Uh, iteration structures and all these very specific things that you've learned, put some of those in there as well, not just the high level. Well, I, have, I have a customer service certificate or I have a degree in marketing. What are the things you've learned and, and what can you highlight uh, that you can legitimately back up in the interview, right? Because as Steve said, you can game it up with a bunch of keywords, but, you be, but if you get picked, you better be able to say, you know, how I, here's how I learned it and where I learned it. And I can talk a little bit about it. So I just wanted to add that point because both very important points and, and, um, and it's great to see, you know, again, other ways for these things to come together. Yeah, gaming the system. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, well, I don't see any other questions in the, ch in the chat, but what I uh, would love to, um, since we have, we have a little bit of time um, left is um, if each of you will kind of talk about how you think how do you think your work is going to um, contribute to solve, resolving some of these issues of access um, and inequality that we are really seeing um, 
really pointed out by the um, particularly economically and um, in higher ed and who's going to be able to uh, come back to campus even in the fall. There's there's a lot of um, work being uh, looked at uh, regarding the dis uh, disparities between who may put off um, going into school or into a training program or who just simply won't have the resources to be able to come back to the campus that they were on. Um, if each of you would talk a little bit about how you feel that your work fits into that and where where you see um, some opportunities for collaboration, that would be great. Steve, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so at, at ed to work since we're not a post-secondary institution, we're more of an intermediary that can help organizations think through strategies and solutions. Um, whether you're a work-based learning provider or an employer or an institution, we work with all. Uh, what, we, what we really want to focus on is identifying some of the things that are working well and raising or lifting up efforts that are working well that are uh, inclusive and scalable. And we're doing that through case studies and research focus groups. Uh, but really what we want to do is identify some of the simplest common sense practices that can be broadly applied across institution types or provider types that will lift up opportunities for more people to return to work or return to school or if they can't return to school in the fall because they are a working learner and they're busy holding down one or two or three jobs to try to keep a family unit together and pay their bills how do we make sure that they don't lose ground in that year or two because we know from research that if you leave school, if you have to stop out for whatever reason, you are less likely to go back. It will, it will dramatically reduce your chances of, of getting that degree. And so we, we try to harness the power of a network at ed to work we are not the solution. We are part of a, a broader solution. We, we are part of a network like GWP, like Sailor, like others, and we say, as a network, how do we support learners with high quality learning, with non-classroom and work-based supports, with connections that maybe a learner or a worker themselves couldn't make, but as intermediaries, we can help make some of those connections and bridge opportunities for them. So as part of this network, we're dedicated to helping working learners uh, specifically maximize their opportunities for workplace and learning success. Excellent. And I noticed that I um, actually I, I, uh, I would like the rest of the panelists to have an opportunity to respond. Jeannie, would you like to would you like to take on this question as well? Um, sure. So I, I think that the key piece to this, I was on a conversation with a number of our CEOs earlier in the week, and we were we were talking in particular about about this challenge and reality of, of trying to be not just diverse, but also inclusive. And, and I think there's an important distinction between those two, those two efforts um, and saw this really interesting statistic that, that we tend to talk about diversity and inclusion all in the same breath. Um, but the reality is that about 80% of the work we do is on diversity and about 20% is on inclusion. And those are actually two different things. And, and, and you measure them in different ways. And so as we think about building our workforce and using skills-based hiring, one, we have to take the long game. We have to recognize that this is, this is going to require that we stay focused on this, not just for like the next month or two, but for like the next decade or two. And, and I, think that's, I think that's really key. What excites me about skills-based hiring when we look at the potential, especially for underrepresented populations to engage more intentionally in the workforce, is, is that it's a way to engage, skills-based hiring is a way to neutralize some of our hiring pathways. So it's a way to get new voices in there and all the skills, if you have C++, you have C++, right? And that is just, that is just a reality. And so when I think about what the potential is of skills-based hiring to ensure that we have not just a diverse, but an inclusive population that's valuing what various, various stakeholders and groups can bring to, to employment and to, to our companies, um, this is a real game changer. It's just a real game changer, but it's going to be really hard. And, and so that's the, that's the final piece I think that I'd like to leave everyone with is that this work is really hard. It is. And like, let's not pretend like we have all the answers because if we did, we would have done it already. It's really hard. And 
The reason we haven't done it already is because one, the world is changing all the time. Um, and two, because it's complicated and there's lots of players involved and you have intermediaries like us and you have universities and community colleges and alternative providers and you have all these, and then you have students who there is no one size fits all student, right? Employee, like everyone has these different characteristics, which is what makes them so amazing, but is also what makes this work so challenging. So I, I do think it's very, very hard work, um, but it's very rewarding work because it has an opportunity to level the playing field and build an inclusive society that I think we all actually really want to live in. And we just haven't had the tools that we needed in order to build it quite right. And so I think we're getting closer every day. And I just hope that with all of our all of our networks and all of our partners at the table, that we can help people keep focused on what that end goal is. Because it's not going to happen overnight, but I actually think we can get there if we remember to hold each other accountable and to drive toward that end goal that we're looking for. Excellent. Excellent. Jeff, would you like to add anything? I think the, uh, these two have summed it up really well. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we're doing our part by providing access through free courseware. And some of that is game changing for people. We have people around the world learning English for the first time, and that makes them more valuable, uh, it, you know, rightly or wrongly, but, but it is. Uh, and then you have the people here, you know, for example, you know, at all different levels, we, we, have, we have had AT&T send incumbent employees to us to take care, take advantage of some of the, PRDV uh, courses. We just had a relationship being built out with a large uh, union with a lot of people who are facing layoffs, uh, and they're 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 they've sort of curated a playlist of of courses for them as well. And we've seen here locally with Central Union Mission, people who are getting their lives back on track that were homeless, um, and a lot of those people come from a lot of different diverse backgrounds. Some of them had you know, middle class existences, right, beforehand, before getting into the homeless uh, system, uh, they now are, you know, part of a wraparound uh, pr process down there using a lot of our certificates uh, as part of their uh, training that they're doing in person. And so we're seeing these things being put in place at a bunch of different levels at people at different levels of the at different entry points, I should say, into, into the workforce, whether it's reskill, upskill, uh, uh, incumbents, et cetera. So, you know, I think um, the, the more we can do as a society to keep costs down, the better. And we realize everyone's not in a position to do free, but um, we saw Google come out with a very low cost uh, digital certificate. They are in a position to do it for free, but I think they're probably going with the assumption that, you know, having some skin in the game might drive completion, especially in the college setting. Uh, but we're seeing though that now that um, the, what can drive completion is really often related to the opportunity people connect to the other end of the of the uh, pipeline, right? And so the work that Ed to Work and Greater Washington Partnership is doing to shine the light on the pipeline, but what's at the other end and how the players and networks come together to get people through and get out and say, oh gosh, if I do this and go down this pathway, I can get an LPN and go to BSN and then eventually if I want to become a nurse practitioner or I can go and become a cybersecurity assistant, and then I'm a cybersecurity manager, and then on up those pipelines. Lots of examples like that uh, with, you know, again, di uh, stackable, digital, portable credentials. Um, so we're doing our part to, to, to try to inject and create models for, for free and open learning that others with more resources can replicate, of course, and, and combine with. Um, so I just think, you know, again, I'm very optimistic and, and just very excited. Uh, I know it's tough out there for people, but lots of opportunity and lots of good people trying to figure it out. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, there are no more questions in the chat. Um, to all my panelists today, I thank you all for joining us and to everyone who registered and attended, um, thank you as well. I just wanted to let you know, put in a very, very brief um, plug in for next month's event. Um, so the plan is that we will do a webinar event every month. Um, will take place uh, July 22nd, and we're talking about degree completion. So helping some of those students that have stopped out that Steve was mentioning um, and several of our panelists had mentioned before um, get back um, 
uh, get back into school and, and earn a meaningful credential, whether that's a degree or otherwise, um, with the University of Memphis. Um, and that webinar is going to pre be presented by ACRO. And we have um, registration information on our website, uh, which you will receive as part of a follow-up email. Um, and also, please do reach out to us if you would like a copy of this um, recording as well. Um, and we will also post that on our site. Thank you all for joining us um, and have a fantastic day. Please do reach out to us if you have any questions. Thanks, everybody. Much appreciated, Thank both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.